Good to be with you tonight. Um, quiz from last night. The quiz is simply going to be, let's rattle off the eight things in order. In order, yeah, it's got to be in order. Got to be out of order, amen? Huh? And you get two weeks in the Caribbean if you get it right. <laughs> The first one, scriptures. Yeah. Then salvation. Mm. Revelation 1, verse 7. <laughs> it was second coming. After the second coming, it then was the Sabbath. Then it was the sanctuary. Then, yeah, resurrection and state of the dead. Then it was spirit of prophecy. Then it was Christ and his saints or the church. There we are. Now the pastor said, none of you are going to the Caribbean anymore, you're going to Blackpool. <laughs> you're satisfied with Blackpool? Um, you're, you're a good lady. <laughs> I've been to Blackpool once and I told my wife, never again. <laughs> yeah, well, Blackpool's not quite the Caribbean. You take what you get, that's right. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Presentation tonight is called The Eyes of the Church. Now, as, as I know, some of these presentations, if not all of them, for some of you, is not telling you necessary things that are new. Amen? Like some of these things you may have heard before. But I believe as Seventh-day Adventists, we should not always be wanting to hear sermons that's always something new. Because sometimes we need to reaffirm or refresh what we already do know. Um, God works on a principle in the book of Daniel. It's called repeat and enlarge. And every time he says a prophecy, he repeats it and gives more information. And I believe God often teaches us that way where you know, we, we may hear a sermon on a certain subject sometimes, several times through our life, but every time we hear it, we may get something from it that we didn't actually get the time before. The mind can't take in 100% at once. Sometimes we can only take in 30. And then the next time you hear something, you may take in the next 10%. And the next time you may take in something more. And we're always kind of adding to what we may know, but it gives us a fuller understanding of the subject at hand. Now, where's my Bible? Is it there? Uh -huh. Now, tonight we're going to kind of go into a subject and give kind of a broad view of the subject. Um, I could, you know, sometimes as Adventists, we know this well. We know the conclusions very well. You know what I mean? Sometimes we're very good at knowing the answer but we don't always know the process that gets to the answer. Now, when you take mathematics or any of those type of subjects in school, if you get the answer right, but you get the process wrong, what happens? Not, you lose marks. Now, oftentimes as Adventists or Christians, we, we, we can learn the answers, but it's always good to refresh how we get to the answer. So tonight's subject is called the eyes of the church. We're going to look into the subject of the gift of prophecy. Now if I was to ask the question, do we believe in the Adventist church and prophets? All of you would be as good Seventh-day Adventists say, yes. And if I said the question, well, do we have a prophet? All of you as good Seventh-day Adventists would be like, yes. Presentation over, done, we can go home. However, it's the process of how we get to those answers that sometimes we need to just kind of get tighter, you know what I mean? And understand that clearly. Because 
prophecy in the future is something that people are kind of interested in in this day and age. How many of you remember a few years ago now, it's almost a decade ago now, the 2010 World Cup? You remember that? It was shockingly painful for the English fans. Shockingly painful. But do you remember this guy, Paul the Psychic Octopus? You remember him on TV, and it was always like they would put these two flags in, in the tank, and the octopus would, whichever one they went in the tank and pulled, or whatever, I forget how they did it, that was who was going to win that game. And, and it was like a national news. We were all fascinated by Paul the Psychic Octopus. We saw which one he would pick and see if that would win. And it kind of encapsulated something about the mind of humans that we are interested about knowing what's in the future. If you just go and survey general society, you'll find that people are interested in knowing what the future has. In the UK, this is from the Times newspaper, 24% of UK residents have, that, that's one in four. One in four UK residents have sought advice from a fortune teller, a psalmist, or a tarot card reader. One in four people have gone to these people to have advice on their lives. 23% of people, and again, that's almost one in four, read horoscopes on a regular basis. Horoscopes, those things in the newspaper, your cancer, whatever it is, Sagittarius, Aquarius, and so on, and you read different descriptions for when you're born in the year, and if you read all of them, they all sound the same. They really do, but people read their one as if it's gospel truth, when if you read the one after that, they'll probably say, yeah, that's me too. But be that as it may, people still read these things. Some, sometimes it's just for, you know, interest, but some people actually do really, you know, 35%, wait, Oh, we've gone all the way back. 35% believe that dreams predict the future. Now, this was in the Times newspaper, October 31st, 2007. 35% of people believe that dreams predict the future here in England. That's a survey they did in the Times newspaper. Now, to me, that is fascinating. They're that high. One third of the country believes in dreams in predicting the future. There's something about the future that people want to know. And I believe God has given us as a church insight into the future through the prophetic writings of the Bible that we have and the prophetic writings of the prophets into the future. Now, there are certain people in society as a whole who claim that they were prophets. Now, question. In the last days, is there going to be prophets, yes or no? Yes, and how do we know that? Give me one good Bible text. Joel chapter 2 and verse 28. The Bible says, you can read here on the screen or turn in your Bible. It says, I will pour out my spirit upon what? All flesh, your sons and your daughters shall, what's the next word? prophesy and your old men will dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. The Bible does, and this verse, if you read it in the context of Joel 2 verse 28, it's in the context of the latter rain being about to be poured out on God's people just before the second coming. And in the context of the latter rain, it says, your sons and daughters shall prophesy and your old men shall dream dreams. So just before Jesus comes, the Bible says there will be, and it doesn't say, it says your sons and what? Daughters, plural indicating that there will be possibly more than one that will prophesy prior to the return of Jesus. Verse 20, 31, it says, before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. Now notice, in Matthew chapter 24, verse 24, you're familiar with this text, it says, for false prophets, false Christs and prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. It's almost like God says, at the end of time, I'm going to have prophets. So Satan says, aha, uh -huh. if you're going to have prophets, I'll have some prophets too. Every time there's a true, there is a counterfeit. Now the problem today is there's so many false prophets. Did I just hit the projector? No, I didn't. So many false prophets that some people kind of get, you know, kind of worn out on this idea of prophets and prophecy. You know, some of these uh, photos on the screen, some of you recognize who these people are. Recognize this guy here? It's Jim Jones, that's right. Jim Jones. What's the story of Jim Jones? 1979, 800 or was it 900 people in Guyana? 
convince them to drink cyanide-laced Kool-Aid? 900 dead. Jim Jones. Recognize this guy here? Maybe not. He didn't kill as many. 35. Marshall Applewhite. Hail Bop Comet, they believe, came down to earth. They were all dressed in all black with um, black Nike trainers on. And again, they all committed suicide, believing that when the Hail Bop Comet came down, they were going to be transported to it and go to a higher plane of existence. This guy here, recognize him? David Koresh. David Koresh. Unfortunately, took many close to home. Amen. Right here from England, Manchester, Nottingham, and other places. Went to America from our churches and died in Waco, Texas. And died in Waco, Texas. So there are false prophets, but there also will be true prophets. Now, how can a true pro we tell a true prophet from the false prophet? What does the Bible say here? Beloved, do not believe what? Every spirit, but do what? It says to test the spirits whether they are of God. Because many false prophets are gone into the world. We should know how to test whether a prophet is true or whether a prophet is false. Now, one of the identifier marks of God's remnant church is that there would be prophets in the church. Now, I believe we already have evidence of one. But we need to take whatever evidence we have and whatever criteria that we use from the Bible, and it will guide us, if ever something is to come in the future, to know if it's true or if it's not. Because some people just kind of get tired, like I said, of the false prophets, and they kind of do away with all of them. But the Bible says, do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, test what? All things, and hold fast what is good. Now this is a text we've read several times this week. What does it say? And the dragon was enraged, or was angry with the woman, and went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God, and have the what? testimony of Jesus. Now we learn that the testimony of Jesus is what? It's a spirit of prophecy based on Revelation chapter 19 and verse 10, where it said, for the testimony of Jesus is, definition, the spirit of prophecy. Now we also learned, notice, we, look, we looked at this the other night, I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And then we saw in Revelation 22 verse 9 that the brethren who had the spirit of prophecy were also called in Revelation 22 verse 9 the prophets. Meaning in the last day church, the testimony of Jesus would be given, but the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, and it's given to the brethren who are also known as the prophets. Now, notice this verse here. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 5 to 7. He says this. He's writing to the church in Corinth, and he says, that you were enriched in how many things? In everything, in, by him in all utterance and knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ. Now the testimony of Christ, I believe, is the same as the testimony of Jesus. Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come short in what? No gift. Eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. What do we learn from this verse here? He writes to the church and he says, I don't want you to be short or deficient in what? Any gift. And he says, I want you to have the testimony of Christ as you wait for the what? The revelation or the, or the coming of Christ. So we see from this verse here that God intended that the testimony of Jesus or the spirit of what? would be in the church, so the church is not deficient as they wait for the coming of who? Jesus Christ. So it wasn't something that was just in Bible times, but he wanted the church to have it continually as they waited for the coming of Jesus. Now, question. Were there prophets in the early church, yes or no? There were. Of 
course they were. Amen. Notice here. Acts 10 verse, Acts 13 verse 1. The Bible says, in the church at Antioch, there were certain what? Prophets and teachers. Notice what it says here in Acts 15 verse 32. Now Judas and Silas, themselves being prophets, exhorted and strengthened the brethren with many words. Now why did I put this verse on the screen? I've got a, another reason for putting this verse on the screen. And I'll ask the question, and you'll get it. Do all prophets have to be an author of a Bible book? And the answer to that question is no. And the reason why the answer is this. Some prophets are what the phrase we use is this. We say a prophet, for example, Moses, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, we would call them, this is the technical term, a canonical prophet. What does that mean? Very good question, David. It means this. In technical language, in some circles, and I don't really know why, so don't ask me why, the Bible is referred to as the canon. Okay? So a canonical prophet is a prophet who has their writings in the, in the Bible or the canon. You have canonical prophets, and then you have non-canonical prophets. For example, is there a book in the Bible called the book of Judas or Silas? No. Is there a book in the Bible called the book of Nathan? No, no, no. But he was a prophet, amen? He's the one that said, David, you are the man. So there's prophets in the Bible that haven't written things. Now that's an important point to note. Because some people will say that if you say so-and-so is a prophet, but then why aren't they writing? Well, not all prophets have their writings in the Bible. And what about this one? Why have I put this verse on the screen? Were there prophets in the early church? Yeah. This man had four daughters, virgins, who what? Now this verse shows that the gift of prophecy was not restricted by gender. You have male prophets and you have female prophets in the early church and there was female prophets in the Old Testament as well. But some people ask the question, and the question is this, why don't we see many prophets today? Or why did we not see prophets for a long time of history? Why? There's a biblical reason why. And the biblical reason is this. And this is why I believe many churches don't have prophets. Notice this verse here, and it brings out a strong principle. The law is no more, and her prophets find what? What is the vision connected to in this verse? The law. If you, re if you would rephrase this verse, they're not keeping the law, and the prophets don't find what? A vision from the Lord. The two are connected. The relationship between how God's people related to the law and how he spoke to them through prophets. Notice here. Let's go into this in a bit more detail. Notice here. Jeremiah 26, verse 4 to 6. If you will... What's the, what's the key word there? If, if, if you will not listen to me to walk in my law, which I have set before you, to heed the words of my servants, the prophets whom I sent you, both rising up early and sending them, but you have not heeded, then I will make this house like Shiloh and make this city a curse to all the nations of the earth. What's the, key, what's the point of this passage here? The blessing of God was conditional on their obedience right notice here Ezekiel 7 verse 26 disaster will come upon disaster and rumor will be upon rumor then they will seek a vision from the prophet but the law will perish from the priest and counsel from the elders there's a there's a there's a relationship in the Old Testament that when God's people were kind of blatantly going away from him he would maybe send them a prophet at the beginning to bring them back on track. But as they would blatantly continue to go away from them, he's kind of like, okay, I'm not talking to you anymore. It's kind of like a parent with their child. You ask a child to do something, and they don't do it, and you're like, well, I'm not telling you anything more until you 
until you do what I said. Until you do what I said. Notice here, where there is, you know, we, 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 we read this verse all the time, but we often read a verse, to be honest, out of context. Where there is no vision, the people what? But he that keeps the what? Do you see the relationship in the first half of the sentence? Where there's no vision, the people perish, but if you what? Keep the law, he's contrasting and comparing between the vision and the, and the law. We often use that verse to talk about vision of the church, which is a good application, but it's probably not the proper direct interpretation of the verse. Where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keeps the law, happy is he. Thus says the Lord, Ezekiel 20, verse 3, Are you come to inquire of me? Notice his strong language. As I live, says the Lord, I will not be inquired of by you. Whoa. God says, have you come to ask me a question? And he's like, <laughs> as long as I live, I will not be answering your questions. Now that verse on its own seems extreme. When you look at the context of the whole of chapter 20, what was happening? I'll tell you what was happening, and then we'll read it. What was happening was this, the children of Israel were going against and breaking the Sabbath. He had already told them about the Sabbath at Sinai. They're breaking the Sabbath willfully, and not just, I'm not, not just talking about, you know, they, you know, not just a little thing, huge, huge breaking of the Sabbath. And God's like, you're asking me for guidance? Uh-uh, uh-uh, uh keep the basics, and then I may guide you. What was the issue? Ezekiel 20, verse 12, is it? Moreover, I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between them and me that they might know that I am the Lord who what? Sanctifies them. And if you read from verses 3 to verse 12, in fact, let's go there. Ezekiel 20. Ezekiel 20, go there. Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 3. Verse 3 you have. As long as I live, I will not be inquired of you, says the Lord. And then you read through the next verses. Verse 4, he says, will you judge them? Verse 5, and I say unto them, thus says the Lord in the day when I chose Israel. So he's kind of going through some history. I lifted them up. Verse 6, in the day I lifted up my hand to bring them from the land of Egypt flowing with, uh, into a land flowing with milk and honey. Verse 7, then I said, cast you away the abominations of your eyes. Verse 8, but they rebelled against me and wouldn't listen to me. And did every man cast, and, and did not every man cast away the abomination of his eyes. Verse 9, but I wrought for my name's sake. Verse 10, I caused them to go forth out of the land of Egypt. I brought them to the wilderness. Verse 11, I gave them my statutes. Verse 12, I gave them my Sabbaths. Verse 13, but the house of Israel rebelled. You see the context of verse 3 now. When verse 3 says, you've come to ask of me, I will not be inquired of you. When you read the next 10 verses, he's like saying, listen, I brought you out of Egypt. I did this for you. I did this for you. I did this for you. But you rebelled and you rebelled and you rebelled. I've got nothing else to say for the moment. There was a relationship between how God spoke with Israel through prophets and how they were keeping the law. Now this is Ezekiel chapter 20, which comes after Ezekiel chapter 8. And some of you may know what I'm talk about to talk about, because in Ezekiel chapter 8, notice here, there were some huge issues that the church was dealing with there. Notice here. Now we don't read all of them, but in Ezekiel chapter 8, he brings him to the... He, 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 in fact, let's go to Ezekiel 8. Ezekiel chapter 8. Ezekiel 8, he shows him all the abominations. Ezekiel chapter 8. Verse 5. The Bible says he shows in images of jealousy. In Ezekiel chapter 8 and verse 14. He says, I'll show you greater abominations. Women weeping for Tammuz, goddess. Then he says in verse 15 and 16, but I'm going to show you some greater abominations. So he shows him images, 
He shows them unclean animals. He shows them women weeping for Tammuz. And then the final abomination, he says, you know what? He brought me to the court of the Lord's house. And there at the door of the temple, between the porch and the altar, there were 25 men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east. And they were worshiping the sun to the east. Can you imagine going to the temple in Israel? And the temple in Israel was built specifically. It was built westwards. Westwards? I think westwards, that sounds right. So as you went into the temple, physically speaking, you would turn with your back to the east. And that was symbolic, because all the other religions of that day were worshipping the sun. So God said, no, no, we're not going to worship the sun. As you walk into my church, you will turn your back to the sun and you'll face the Shekinah glory as you walk in. These people were turning their backs to the Shekinah glory and they're worshipping the sun in church. Imagine coming to church on Sabbath and at the door there you find your pastor and elders all worshipping the sun on Sabbath morning. Woo! That's serious stuff. That's what was happening in Israel. So that's why when God says, have you come to inquire of me? You're worshipping the sun. You're worshipping Tammuz. You're doing all these terrible things in Israel and you want me to speak to you through a prophet? He's like, no, no. There's a relationship between how God's people kept the law and how he guided them and spoke with them. Is there going to be prophets in the last days? I believe there is. Because we've read that verse in the Bible already. That there will be the gift of prophecy in the last days in Revelation 12, verse 17. Let me share with you some of the, the, the tests of a prophet. Now, some of you may know one, and I'm not going to go through every test of a prophet. We're just going to do some of the basic tests of a prophet. Here is one of the most basic tests of a prophet, and it is this. And this eliminates certain people or certain beliefs out there in prophecy. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God. Because many false prophets have gone into the world. By this you will know the spirit of Christ, God, sorry, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of who? So one test of a prophet is this. It's also a test of a good preacher or a good teacher. The test is this. Do they confess that Jesus Christ is God? That has to be. You can't say he's just a good man. You can't say he's a prophet. You can't say he's a good teacher. You can't say he was a moral man. No, 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 no. No, no, no. You have to say that Jesus is what? God. One test. Okay? Now, what about this? Must the prophet, prophet confess Jesus Christ as God? Well, we've just read that. What's the next one? Here. Must the prophet agree with the Bible and God's law? Hmm. They must. They must. And what verse do we use for that? Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20. To the law. And to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it's because there's no light in them. Now, what's the point of this? The, the point is this. A prophet cannot come along and negate, and negate something that's come before. If someone comes along and claims they're a prophet and says, you know what? You know what that commandment that people say you've got to keep? Actually, you don't. And the Lord told me to come to you and tell you that. You're like, ah, ha, ha, ha. The prophet can't negate what God has previously shown. Okay? They must agree with the law and the testimony. Now, what about, so they hear a prophet must confess Jesus as God. They must agree with the Bible and uphold God's law. Third question. Actually, no, not third question. Let me read a verse. For he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. Why have I put that text on the screen? Because it's true. And the reason what I'm going to explain is this. The reason why that text is there, a prophet is not there to tell you how to invest in the stock market. A prophet is not there to tell you how to make the most money. A prophet is there to do what? Edify the church and bring comfort to the church. 
The role of the prophet is edifying the church. It's not the strategic things or financial things or things like that. That's never the role that a prophet has. They're always there to edify and to guide the church. It goes on, he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. Will a prophet's predictions come true? Yeah, Jeremiah 28 verse 9. When the word of the prophet comes to pass, the prophet will be known as one whom the Lord has what? Truly sent. When a prophet predicts something, it should come to pass. There are exceptions though, and the exceptions are these. The exceptions are when a prophecy is conditional. What's an example of a conditional prophecy in the Bible? Yep, that's right. He said, if you do this, then I'll do this, and if you don't, then I'll do that. So right there, there's a condition there. Jonah. Jonah said, the city is going to be destroyed, but if you what? If you repent, it's not, you know, it's all more like telling them what's going to happen. It's going to be destroyed, but if you repent, then it won't. The city wasn't destroyed, at least not then, it was destroyed about 50 years later. But when the prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not happen or come to pass, this is the thing that the Lord has not spoken, the prophet has spoken it presumptuously, you shall not be afraid of him. So in one verse it said the prophet has to say it, and here it says, if they say it and it doesn't happen, then don't listen. So a prophet's predictions should come true. And the last one we're going to look at, and there are other tests in the Bible, there's more specific ones, but these are kind of the broad general ones. And the last one we're going to look at, what is the fourth test for a true prophet? Therefore by their what? Now this is the general test you apply to all Christians, but it means a prophet is not exempt from this. A prophet who claims to be a prophet and receive messages from God should live a life in accordance with that. You can't claim to have the gift of prophecy and have three wives. Amen? You can't claim to have the gift of prophecy and be involved in embezzlement. You can't claim to have the gift of prophecy and have all types of scandalous things written about you, half of them which are true. How do we relate to people who have the gift of prophecy? We read this verse earlier. We read this verse earlier. The Bible says, do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, test all things, hold fast what is what? What is good. Now there are several people who have come around who I don't believe are prophets. You had um, Joseph Smith. I don't believe Joseph Smith was a prophet. He fails on a few accounts of just those four basic ones predicting things that weren't true. I don't believe his life was quite up to par. But I believe if you look in the remnant church, I believe in God's church, I believe that we can find someone who does have the all four tests and more. Who does have all four tests and more. And that person, I believe, is a woman by the name of Ellen Gould White. She was born in 1827. Some of you know this already. And if you took the church history exam, you should know this well by heart. Amen. She had her first vision at the age of 17 in the year 1844. Okay? Over the course of her life, she had 2,000 visions and dreams, at least. Did you know she is the third most translated author in history? Full stop. Like, of anyone. Third most translated author. And she is the most translated American author that has ever been born on the top side of the earth and swore allegiance to the flag of the United States. She wrote 40 books, thousands of periodical articles on a wide range of topics. She started missions, hospitals, churches, Loma Linda University, Loma Linda Hospital, schools, universities, Oakwood University, Andrews University, the list goes on. Avondale University. All of these were started by her being a key player in the equation. What, do we, what does the Adventist church officially believe on Ellen White? From the book Seventh-day Adventists Believe, page 227. 
The writings of Ellen White are not a substitute for Scripture. They cannot be placed on the same level. The Holy Scriptures stand alone, the unique standard by which her and all other writings must be judged, and to which they must be what? Subject. Okay? Now let's go through the tests. Because some people will say to Adventists, will you believe that because Ellen White said? Well, actually, as Adventists, we believe our key fundamental 28 beliefs because the Bible says it. Amen? And we saw in our presentation a few nights ago that the role that Ellen White had in the formation of doctrine as we rose up as a church was always to confirm and enrich. It wasn't to form. Did Ellen White confess Jesus? Well, let's see what she says. I'll just share with you a few quotes. This is probably one of the best quotes you'll find on Jesus, ever. Christ is the pre-existent, self-existent Son of God. The Lord Jesus Christ, the divine Son of God, existed from eternity, a distinct person, yet one with the Father. That's a very succinct, profound description of Jesus as God. And probably one of the most succinct and profound ones that you will ever find. In heavenly places, three, five, four. Search the Bible, for it tells you of Jesus. I want you to read the Bible and see the matchless charms of Jesus. I want you to fall in love with the man of Calvary. Here she's pointing people towards Jesus Christ. So that every step you may say to the world, his ways are ways of pleasantness, and all his paths are peace. Now, did she agree with the scriptures? What did she, how did she relate to the Bible? Notice what she said about the Bible in the book Great Controversy, page 7. The holy scriptures are to be accepted as an authoritative, infallible revelation of his will. They are the standard of character, the revealer of doctrines, and the what? Test of experience. She referred to her, her writings in the book Cole Porter Ministry as the lesser light to guide people to the greater light. She said, a little heed has been given to the Bible. Therefore, she said, the Lord has given a lesser light, referring to herself, to guide men and women to the greater light. Then she said, cling to your Bible as it reads, and stop your criticism in regard to its validity. Obey the word, and not one of you will be lost. When you read through her writing, she's always uplifting and guiding you to the Bible. Now, what about her predictions, were they accurate? I'll share with you a couple. I'll share with you a general one, then a specific one. The general one is this, 1904. Soon great trouble will arise, trouble that will not cease till Jesus comes. True or false? So far it's been true. War hasn't stopped since then. Now some of you may say, well that's kind of general because we've kind of always had war. But let me give you a more specific one. More specific one. Manuscript 29, 1886, page 14. Or page, yeah. One to four. Tobacco is a slow, insidious, but most malignant poison. Now some of you reading that are like, duh, we know that. Look at the date, 1886. Do you know what year the top surgeon, whatever they're called in England, surgeon, in America they're the surgeon general, I'm not sure what the surgeon, the top surgeon in England's called. In the United States, the surgeon general said, tobacco causes cancer in the year, what's that year there, 1886? The Surgeon General in America said tobacco causes cancer in 1957. 70 years ahead of her time. And in the UK, I think it was 1958 or 57 or 56, it was somewhere around there. The point is, she had insight that was far beyond her education and was 71 years ahead of the medical profession. 71 years ahead. In fact, let me share with you some of the few other things that she said about health. There is a man who lived, he was a professor at Cornell University. 
Cornell University is what we call in America an Ivy League school. You heard of Ivy League schools? There's about 10 of them, and they are the top private schools in America. Dr. Clive McKay was a professor at Cornell University, which is in upstate New York. He was a biochemist, nutritionist, gerontologist, and professor of animal husbandry. Now, he said this. He said this. He went on record as saying, every thoughtful modern nutritionist must be impressed by the soundness of Mrs. White's teachings, in spite of the fact that she lived nearly a century ago, 1959. Now, you may wonder, how did Dr. Clive McKay hear about Ellen White? This is how he heard about it. One of his students, this lady here, had a father, this man here. That's Dr. Clive McKay in the middle. This man here, who was the father of this lady here, was called Philip Chen. He wrote a book, he was a pretty intelligent man, he wrote a book about the soybean, soybean for health, longevity, and economy. When his daughter went to study at Cornell University, he gave his daughter Ministry of Healing, counsels on diet and food, and said, give these to your professor and see what he thinks. He read them, and that's when he quoted those things that we've just read, okay? Where he said, in spite of the fact that the works of Mrs. White were written long before the advent of modern scientific nutrition, no better overall guide is available, what? Today. Here we have Professor Ivy League School. Now, Dr. Clive McKay, it goes one step further and it comes closer to our time. He had a student called Dr. Colin Campbell. Dr. Colin Campbell graduated from Cornell University and then became a professor at Cornell University. I have a colleague of mine, some of you know him, called Don McIntosh. He called up Clive McKay, um, he called up Colin Campbell and said, I want to invite you to my church. So he paid him to come out to his church, and he interviewed him. And this is what he asked him. He said, do you think Dr. McKay was right to so strongly endorse the health statements of Ellen White? Why or why not? Dr. Colin Campbell said this, and he wrote a book called The China Study, which was the most comprehensive study of nutrition ever studied. It was published about 10 years ago. Very big, very... Um, medically sound, etc., etc. book. He said, I am not aware of anyone who was more on point than Ellen White. Given her background, she is truly an amazing woman. He went on to say, he did go on to say, here, I am convinced that almost 100% of these statements are now substantially supported by the scientific evidence during the past two to three decades. Here you have a medical profession from Cornell University saying 100% of her statements are substantially supported by modern scientific medicine. You know what sometimes is sad amongst us as a church? That we wait for science to verify something that she said before we'll actually do it. Like, oh, oh, yeah, there was a report in the newspaper. Yeah, let's do it now. God gave us insight way ahead of the rest of the population. Such as the tobacco one. The tobacco is the most obvious one, but there's many, many other ones. Reading on, what I've come to realize to even deeply worry about is why it is that this message of Ellen White and others has been so mislaid on shelves out of sight. This guy's not Adventist. It is abundantly clear to me that now is the time to bring this forward in whatever way that each of us are able to do so. I believe this is just one example from someone secular saying that, hey, the writings of this lady are way ahead of their time. Were her predictions true? I believe they were. They were ahead of time. Was Ellen White life consistent with God's word? Well, you know, the best way to find out what people think about you is to die. And then secretly listen to what they say about you after you're dead. So if you die, read your eulogies. If you die, you know, kind of, Read, hear what people say about you. Now, I'm being facetious, but when you want to really know what people said about Ellen White, then read what they wrote about her after she died. Read how she's remembered. But not just that. When you read some of the, you know, sometimes we look at Ellen White, great controversy and all these things, testimonies to the church. When you actually sometimes read some of the books that talk about her actual personal life, it's fascinating. She really did live what she preached. 
I was reading, I was down in Australia and went to a house there and, and they were telling us that when she lived there, the problem in the area near Avondale was that the people were getting all their linen stolen off the washing lines. Because there were really poor people that lived just a few miles away and they would come there to the Adventist little village and steal the clothes and go back. What did Ellen White do? She got on a horse and buggy and went over to those houses. Went around, knocked on the doors, met with the people, and said, I'm going to teach you how to make your own clothes. And then she would run classes for the ladies there, teaching them how to make clothes and how to do seamstress work, etc. She was very, very practical. And we, we often as a church don't read those parts about her life. But when you read the smaller, finer print, so to speak, you find she was very, very practical. Notice here, this is in St. Helena Star, that's just near where she died in, um, in Elms Haven, California. The life of Mrs. White is an example worthy of emulation by all. She was a humble, devout disciple of Christ and ever went about doing good. Honored and respected by all who appreciate noble womanhood, consecrated to unselfish labor for the uplifting and betterment of mankind. And in New York, where she also lived, the newspaper said after her death, she showed no spiritual pride and she sought no filthy lucre. She lived a life and did the work of a worthy prophetess, the most admirable of the American succession. I believe she lived the life of a prophet. There's also a quote from a, uh, a, a news person in America who said that women have been honored on American postage stamps more than 100 years, starting with one woman who was not an American, Queen Isabella in 1893. Since then, 86 women have been honored, ranging from Martha Washington to Marilyn Monroe. But also many women authors like Louisa May Alcott, Emily Dickinson, but I can name an American author who has never been honored thus. Though her writings have been translated into 148 languages, more than Marx or Tolstoy, more than Agatha Christie, more than William Shakespeare. Only now is the world coming to appreciate her recommended prescription for optimum spiritual and physical health. Ellen White, Ellen White, you don't know her? Get to know her. That's my radio broadcast in 1997 from just a secular radio broadcast saying, hey, the world doesn't know, but the world should know. I believe God has given us insights. Prophets do not take the place of the Bible. Amen? Prophets do not establish doctrine. Prophets, doctrine must come from the Bible, and they give insight and instruction that applies the Bible to today. Now, I believe the ministry of Ellen White, as I was sharing with, with someone yesterday after the presentation, is a very broad and wide ministry. She's written a commentary on almost every book of the Bible. She's got testimonies to the church, nine volumes, selected messages, books on how to raise a family, books on how to raise children, books on health, books on life, books on a whole variety of issues. And sometimes people say, is another prophet ever going to rise again? Now, I'll just tell you what I think. I'm not really telling you what, what exactly I know. I know the Bible does say that your sons and daughters will prophesy before the day of the Lord. Amen? Therefore, I believe it is fully possible that there will be more prophets that arise as we get closer to the second coming. My personal view is, though, I don't believe we'll have another prophet that will be as comprehensive as we have. I believe we may get specific ones that may guide our church, maybe through a particular crisis or maybe on a particular issue. But I don't know if we'll have a prophet with the same breadth of writing and as comprehensive as we already have. That's my personal belief, but, you know, there's nothing to base that on other than we already have a pretty wide um, breadth already. You know, look at some of the fruits of her labor. The schools that were started, I believe that's Southern Adventist University. The hospitals that were started. You know, it's fascinating to see the hospitals. You know, in fact, I went to Loma Linda. Well, my sister lives near there, so I, I go there quite often. And when I see her. It's fascinating to read the story of Loma Linda. Ellen White saw in vision this plot of land. Five years before she went there. She was riding on a horse carriage on her way to California, and there was someone there who had bought a piece of land and put, put some money down on it, thinking maybe it was you know, the only plot of land for sale. She got there, she got out of her carriage, she looked around, and she said, I've been here before. 
And her son, Willie White, was like, no, mother, we've never been here before. She said, no, I've been here before. She said, no, mother, we've never been here. She says, no, I have seen this land before. This is the land the Lord told me to buy. At the church, I forget what it was back then, $5,000 we paid for that land. You couldn't put that type of value on it today. Southern California, I can tell you a two, three bedroom house in Southern California, just down the road from Loma Linda University now, will cost you like $400,000. God knew what he was doing, amen? In guiding our church, some of the places where we bought properties, Avondale University, same kind of story. The Lord showed up by that plot of land. And the Lord has blessed our church on numerous occasions in those instances in the early days that helped to guide us and be in a place where we are today. You go to Australia, Sydney. Sydney Adventist Hospital at the time was built 40 kilometers from Sydney city center. Ellen was like, hmm, there. Let's buy, build a hospital there. Australia has national health just like we do. Sydney Adventist Hospital is the largest private hospital in the whole country. In a country where they have a national health service, you have Sydney Adventist Hospital, which is now, check this out, when it was built was 40 kilometers out the center of Sydney. Now, as a city has grown, the neighborhood that it's in is one of the richest neighborhoods in Sydney. And just, do you believe who goes there? The rich and famous of Australia. When Russell Crowe wants to get some treatment, where does he go? National Health Service? No, no, no. Sydney Adventist Hospital. Divine insight, amen? Divine insight. That guided and, ben and we've benefited from it. If you've never read any of Ellen White's writings, you can go to whiteestate.org and read some of her writings there. You can talk to your pastor or your elders. I'm sure they may have some books that they can get a hold of you get hold of, to give to you. And I would suggest that if you've never read anything before, pick up a book and read. My favorite one that I've ever read is the book Desire of Ages. Beautiful book. Beautiful book. Desire of Ages, Steps to Christ. Great Coventry, if you like your history, it gives the history of the church, the Reformation, and all those type of things. God has given to us insight that has been there to guide us as a church. And I believe our prophetic identity it's one of the key marks of God's church today. And it was given that, you know, people say, well, well why do we need a prophet? And I'll share with you this as we close. I believe it's given to guide our church in the end. And it's kind of like this. The end time prophet doesn't negate what's come before. They add to it. For example, let me share with you an illustration. I don't like sat navs. I don't like them. The reason why I don't like them, I think I have control issues. <laughs> I don't like being told where to go by some voice. But joking aside, <laughs> I really like to know where I'm going. I like to look at a map, and I like to see point A to point B. I like to see the road that goes there, but I also like to see the option of going there, 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 and there. I like to be aware of where I'm driving, not just drive 200 yards, oh, now turn, drive 300 yards, no, no, no. Hmm. My mom bought me one as a present. I gave it back to her and said, thanks, but no thanks. <laughs> I've got a car now that has one in the car. Can't get away from that. I never use it. Just don't like it. I like maps. And I like to kind of know my way around, so I know if I'm driving somewhere, I like to have a, a general idea if I'm going to London. From here to London, how'd you go? Well, you turn left on Victoria Road. Then you turn left at the lights there. Then you get to the A500 and you turn right. If you turn right on the A500, it will take you to junction 15 of the M1. When you get to junction 15 of the M M6, when you get to junction 15 of the M6, thank you very much, you drive south. You drive south on the M6 and you've got a choice. You can either go the M42, to the M40, depending on which part of London you go into, or you keep going on the M6, and then you take the M1 south. Now, that will get you to London. 
But if somebody said, I want to, you to go to like, you know, 21 Taylor Street in Hackney, London. Now I know I'll have to take the M1 South, that will take me all the way into London, all the way to the end. I'll then take the North Circular, and then I'll then take one of those A roads that will take me further into London. And that's about as far as I could go by memory. Then when I get closer there, I'd have to pull out a map. I'll use map on my phone to see where I am, and that will highlight and zoom in and help to guide me to my destination. Now the second map I look at, does that negate the first map? Mm -mm. It just magnifies it as you get closer to your destination. And I believe that's the role that prophets play in the last days. They don't negate what was written in the Bible. They don't change what's written in the Bible. But as we're getting closer to our destination, sometimes we need greater magnification to guide us so we arrive at our destination safely. And I believe God has given us an extra bit of magnification. I pray God may bless us as we are part of this church and as we're guided to our destination in these last days. Let's bow our heads as we close with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for how you have guided your people and your church in the past. Bless us, Lord, we pray. Be with this church here. Be with all the believers that are here. Be with all the churches that are represented by those present here. Lord, I pray that you would bless each one of us, that we may be a faithful witness for you in our families, amongst our families, in our homes, in our workplaces, in our schools, and that we may be sure of our identity, not ashamed of it, but sure of it, not proud of it, but humble in a knowledge of you've, how you've called us in these days. Bless us, Lord, we pray, and be with us through the remainder of this Sabbath day is our humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.